and the FCC. There was a core ideological conflict within the federal government, of course, because while this was a federal mandate from the mid-90s on, it was yet also a time in which marketplace ideology was as strong as it had ever been in the history of the United States. And that dictates relatively low levels of government involvement and leadership. So it set up a conflict. Let's have this conversion and let's ask the government to do some things, but, but let's not ask the government to do some things. So there were conflicting signals going to the federal agencies out of Congress and it's reflected in the legislation. The consequences were that the FCC and many of the other agencies, including the Department of Commerce, were slow to develop a lot of the fundamental requirements that were necessary to get this, this train going. Uh, the public information and education campaigns were very, very slow to come out. You'll notice that they really only began to happen in earnest about a year ago. They should have been, they should have been pushing it hard five, six, eight years ago uh, and only got the act together relatively re recently. The FCC was very slow uh, to ask the manufacturers to change their standards in the receiver sets. And so you were still buying NTSC sorts of sets without digital uh, capability up until quite recently. Uh, the converter box program, which is really the proximate cause of the delay right now, was uh, uh, very poorly designed by Congress and, it, and the Department of Com uh, Commerce had to implement it. I, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of criticism of uh, NTIA and the Department of Commerce about this. It's actually the problem lies with the legislation itself. The federal bureaucrats are doing their best with a, with a piece of legislation that really doesn't make sense in a lot of ways. Uh, the uh, translator standards is a big issue for some public television stations and licensees uh, I'll talk about in, in a minute, uh, also have been very slow to be forthcoming. Also, the government made some poor decisions or indecisions. It, it didn't do some things about the uh, cable and direct broadcast satellite carriers. It failed to impose digital must-carry rules in the way that they're, they're uh, uh, imposed uh, uh, already in analog. Uh, so that, that gave the carriers a great deal of freedom to opt out of doing some of the things that they've had to do over the years with analog and, uh, and, and undercuts aspects of the conversion. Uh, they didn't require, the, uh, the FCC didn't require the full digital build out uh, f for the carriers and uh, only a primary video signal uh, requirement. I'll get to that in a little bit more. On the industry side, the uh, consumer electronics industry was very slow to begin making uh, new TV sets. Uh, that, that slowed the natural, quote unquote, natural consumer receiving set turnover. So you didn't get people eight, seven years ago buying new sets at cheap prices uh, the way you can now and therefore s setting the stage uh, for the conversion. Commercial broadcasters themselves were also ambivalent about this. They, they, they were really uncertain about the business model for, uh, for standard definition multicasting. They, em they embraced HD. They kind of could see uh, the uh, market attractiveness of that in terms of one signal, a primary video signal, but they just were really uneasy about the multicasting. And so it didn't get pushed very, very hard. The cable and DBS carriers uh, forced the idea of primary video uh, they made grand claims about being into the digital area, but it was largely only around uh, high definition. They developed compression technology to squeeze the broadcast channels down and are still working on that. Uh, that allowed them to evade, in the end, any requirement for 19.4 megabits equivalency. That is to say, they never were required to take everything that comes off of a broadcast transmitter antenna. Okay? they could take some of that and satisfy the FCC requirements for di digital conversion. So there was a great disincentive for the broadcasters to go back up to that multicasting model and push that out because they're putting it on the air, but the cable carriers, which you know, prov uh, provide 60 to 65 percent of ser the service to households uh, in the country, weren't necessarily going to carry everything that you were uh, throwing off from your transmitter and your antenna. For the carriers, it was all about recovering bandwidth. Why? Because in their own technical infrastructures, they wanted to be able to maximize their capacity for their own channels and their subscription services. And bluntly, that's about movies, that's about sports, and it's about pornography. 
those were the channels that they could make money on and they wanted uh, to exploit the capacity uh, that they had. And that way they squeezed down the, uh, the uh, broadcast uh, channel uh, capacity. Current status, um, as you've heard, there is a, is a hardcore, God, pornography, hardcore, uh, a, a group of, uh, the, these puns come to me, I didn't do it intentionally, a hardcore unconverted uh, group nationally, it may be only about six to eight percent of the households who really aren't ready. Uh, in Denver, Nielsen tells us now that that number is down less than uh, five percent, but as you saw in the video, and satire is often based in reality, uh, it's disproportionately elderly, minority, uh, and, and lower income. Now, as we t have said, Congress may impose a further delay from February to uh, mid-June, mid but as you can sense already, this uh, decision is heavily politicized. Uh, uh, it didn't get through the House yesterday, and that there's no, it's absolutely uh, no coincidence that was the same day uh, that the, uh, the stimulus legislation went through. Right? And it was very much related to what was going on in that debate. Uh, what are the impact of these issues on public television and its viewers? On the positive opportunity side, of course, what this uh, provides us with is the ability to produce more visually interesting and educational content. You know, think of a NOVA, a good science program, anything that's got any kind of pedagogic, educational, you can really show things very, very well uh, and intently. Um, uh, grand panoramic pictures and videos uh, of, of geography and landscapes and travel uh, and so on and so forth. You also can offer for, far more programming and services through the, the standard definition multicasting. It gives us a chance to do more of the things that, that we do well. And what you'll find is that public television generally is trying to exploit that much more aggressively than the commercial uh, world. We don't know where we're going to get the money for it, but we know that there is an opportunity to be able uh, to provide much uh, greater public service. The challenges associated with this are several. The conversion was very costly. The total bill for public television will come out somewhere between one and a half and two billion dollars. That's equal to one full year of the entire budget for all of public television and radio in these United States of America. That's NPR, PBS, all of the stations. That's the cost of our digital conversion as a system. It was an unfunded mandate. Uh, the federal government underfunded PTB, uh, PTV's costs by half. They've given us probably somewhere now and may top out between 400 and 500 million uh, versus what had been promised to be about 800 uh, million to a billion dollars uh, of those conversion costs. The vast majority of the U.S. states, 40 or 44 or 45, helped with the conversion. And these were, in ca many cases, states that did not otherwise support their public radio and television stations on an annual basis. They made special capital grants to do it. Guess which state <laughs> was among the five or six that did not help us out in any way? Okay, Colorado. This situation forced the public television stations around the country to mount capital campaigns for digital equipment which on one level is okay, except that as many donors told us at many of the places, why are we having to give you money for, for black boxes and equipment? We'd rather be giving you money for programming, content, services, and the new applications that you're putting for. We literally had to put our endowment planning and fundraising at station after station after station around the country on hold while we went after uh, this digital conversion money uh, to make the match for the federals. The other issues uh, facing uh, public television are, of course, higher operating costs. I've already uh, alluded to that. The estimates here are not reliable, but they could be uh, as high as 25 to 55, 50 percent more, particularly as you build out uh, the multicasting services uh, uh, and, and increase your uh, high definition production capacity. Uh, with no translator rules, many state public television stations are left in the limbo. It's a problem that our, our friends at Channel 6 are, are facing uh, because of their heavy uh, translator uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, and there are um, 15 or 18 uh, state networks around the country that are having similar problems uh, in this regard. Congress misused the auction proceeds. I'll just come out and say it. Uh, uh, the monies from selling off this, this public airwave space, where did it go? in a deficit reduction. 
just right into the black hole, you know, the, the maw of the, of, the, of the federal budget without any real thought.